Hello everyone. We're continuing our discussion of neoclassical growth theory. Specifically now we're moving into sessions 5 and 6 from the Econ 201 Macro 1 part of the course. And what we are looking at in these sessions is what factors can affect the steady state equilibrium in the neoclassical growth theory. If you recall, the point of us looking at neoclassical growth theory is to try and understand how countries can go about achieving or obtaining increases in economic growth. Growth accounting theory, which we learnt about in sessions one and two, was able to inform us about what the contribution is of different factors of production to output growth, but it couldn't tell us what an economy would need to do in order to achieve increases in economic growth. Neoclassical growth theory allows us to start answering this question, and so what we are now going to look at is changing some of the parameters that we've been learning about in the neoclassical growth theory up until this point, with a view to try to understand whether or not changing these will affect the economic growth rate. The first one that we're going to be looking at is a change in the savings rate. So the first thing that I want to do is just look at a savings function by itself. So I'm drawing in the savings function on my neoclassical growth theory model. So specifically, if you recall here, we've got capital per person. And on the vertical axis, we have output per person. And if you recall, the savings function looked like this. S is equal to S, F, K, or is equal to S, Y. So our savings function was positively sloped because increases in output per person will result in an increase in savings per person. Output per person increases at a decreasing rate and so if we save a constant percentage, S, of our output per person, then as output per person increases at a decreasing rate, savings per person will also increase at a decreasing rate. The other thing is that the savings function lay below the production function. I haven't drawn the production function in here, but if you recall, the savings function lay or lies below the production function because we don't save all of the output per person that is generated. So what we want to try and look at, or try to understand, is how the position of the savings function could change if there was a change in the savings rate. So let's just work with an example quickly. Let's just say that output per person was 100, and the savings rate, S was 0.2, then savings per person would be 20. Okay? But if the savings rate for the same output per person went up, so it's no longer S, it's now S1, and it went up to say 0 0.4, then the amount of savings would change. Instead of being 20, it would be 40. Okay? So when there was an increase, in the savings rate such that the new savings rate is bigger than the old savings rate, this causes savings to increase. Okay? How would we show that on our graph? Any thoughts? Well, I hope you're thinking what I'm thinking, because what I'm thinking is that what we need to show or what we need to do to our graph in order to be able to demonstrate an increase in the savings rate is that our savings function would pivot upwards. And by pivot upwards, I mean do this. Okay? So S1 is equal to S1, F, K. So let's just, so that we all know where we are at, let's say there was this certain amount of capital stock that generated a certain amount of output per person. I haven't drawn the production function in, but that doesn't matter. And that, in the first instance, allowed this economy to generate savings per person equal to 20. 
but then the savings rate increased. So output per person didn't change. Output per person didn't change. And the capital stock per person didn't change. The only thing that changed was the savings rate. And when the savings rate changed, in our example here, what happened was that savings increased from 20 to 40. And if we were to show that for various different capital to labor ratios and their corresponding levels of output per person, what we would see is that when there is an increase in the savings rate, this causes the savings function to pivot upwards. Notice that it's not a shift. Why? Because when there is zero capital stock per person, there is no output per person, and therefore there is no savings per person. There is no savings per person if there is no capital per person when the savings rate is 20% and when the savings rate is 40% and when the savings rate is 20%. If you don't have any capital stock per person and therefore no output per person, it doesn't matter how big your savings rate is, the amount of savings will still be zero. And that's why it's a pivot. The savings function pivots upwards from the origin, so the intercept here is still at the origin. Okay, so if there is an increase in the savings rate, that will pivot upwards the savings function. Similarly, although I'm not going to go through that example, a decrease in the savings rate would pivot the savings function downwards. So if there was a decrease in the savings rate, we would draw our new savings curve below the original savings curve. Okay. What we now want to do is think about how this affects the neoclassical growth model overall. And so what I'm going to do is now draw in the full model, and what we are going to then go and explain is how the change in the savings rate will affect capital stock per person, so capital per person, and output per person, given that the savings rate has changed, output per person. Okay, so we start in or out by drawing our production function. Remember it's positively sloped, increases in capital stock per person, increase output per person, but at a decreasing rate. We draw in the savings function, S is equal to SFK, and the savings function is positively sloped because as capital per person increases, output per person increases at a decreasing rate. We save a constant portion of our output per person, which increases at a decreasing rate, and therefore savings per person also increases at a decreasing rate. I'm also going to draw in the investment requirement line here, N plus D K, and what this allows us to do is establish at what capital to labor ratio steady state occurs. Now if you recall from the previous video, the capital to labor ratio is at steady state where the savings function and the investment function intersect each other. This allows us to establish the steady state level of capital stock per person and the steady state level of output per person. We now need to ask ourselves what's going to happen if there is an increase in the savings rate. What we've just learned is that when the savings rate increases, so when the savings rate increases, um, specifically so that the new savings rate exceeds the old savings rate, this causes savings to increase and the savings function to pivot upwards. I'm going to draw that in, and so this is S1 is equal to S1 F K. All right. And what you should notice is that this is going to cause a change to the steady state equilibrium in this model. Why? Well, because originally the economy is at steady state. The capital to labor ratio, K star, and the output per person, Y star, they're positive, but they're not changing. The growth in output per person and the growth in capital stock per person is equal to zero.
But if there is a change in the savings rate, such that in this economy people begin to save a larger portion of their output per person than before, this means that there is more savings available and the savings function pivots upwards. That means that at the existing capital to labor ratio, K star, there is now an excess of savings over investments. Okay, we can see that the green savings function now lies above the investment requirement line. Recall the investment requirement line is telling us how much investment per person is needed to maintain the various capital to labor ratios. At steady state, previously at point A, there was just enough investment per person being generated to maintain the capital to labor ratio at K star. But if there's an increase in the savings rate, the savings function pivots upwards and now the amount of savings per person required to maintain the capital to labor ratio at K star is now bigger than the amount of investment required to maintain that capital to labor ratio at K star. And when savings per person exceeds investment per person, this causes the capital to labor ratio to increase. So, our capital to labor ratio will start to increase. As the capital to labor ratio increases, output per person begins to increase, but at a decreasing rate. Why? Because of diminishing marginal returns. Even if you're getting more capital stock per person, the way in which output increases is that it doesn't increase in a constant fashion. Output per person increases at a decreasing rate because of diminishing marginal returns to capital stock. As output per person increases at a decreasing rate, savings per person also increases at a decreasing rate. There's a movement along this new savings function. So savings per person is also increasing at a decreasing rate. But the amount of investment needed to maintain these higher capital to labor ratios is increasing at a constant rate. And that constant rate is equal to the sum of the population growth rate and the depreciation rate of capital. What this means is that the gap between savings per person and investment per person will get smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually a new steady state is reached and let's call that at A star. Okay, at A star star. So at this new steady state, what's changed? Well, at the new steady state, the amount of savings per person has increased in comparison to before. The amount of investment per person has increased in comparison to before. That has been made possible because of the fact that the savings rate increased. In this economy, people started saving a higher portion of their output per person than what they were saving previously. The consequence of that is that the capital to labor ratio was able to increase because with that increase in savings per person, the additional pool of funds that was available for firms to borrow from enabled them to invest in more capital stock, and so capital stock per person started to rise. As capital stock per person increased, output per person increased, but at a decreasing rate. So the level of savings increased at a decreasing rate, until eventually the new steady state equilibrium is reached at a level of output per person which is higher than before, so Y double star is greater than Y star, and at a level of capital stock per person that is also greater than before. K double star is greater than K star. So what's gone on here is that we now have a new steady state. But notice the following. In the new steady state, once that steady state has been reached, there will be no further changes in either capital stock per person or output per person. Why? Neither capital stock per person nor output per person will grow any further once the new capital to labor ratio has been reached, once this new steady state has been reached, because when there is steady state, the amount of investment per person 
required to keep the capital to labor ratio constant is just being met by the amount of savings per person being generated in that economy. So at that new set steady state, savings is once again equal to investment per person. So it is only between the steady states that output per person and capital output per person and capital per person can grow. Once the new steady state has been reached, output per person is higher than before and the capital to labor ratio is also higher than before, but then they remain constant at those higher values. The growth in output per person and the growth in capital per person remains the same. All right, in the next video, what we are going to do is to consider the effect of a change in the population growth rate and also effect of the change in the depreciation rate of capital. Again, please note that the one thing which I haven't explicitly spoken about is the change in the economic growth rate, the overall change in aggregate output that takes place. Please note that in this particular model, there is aggregate economic growth, and in particular, that this economy is growing at a rate equal to the population growth rate. But that I will need to use a separate video to explain, and so I will do that in a separate session.